I've done a lot of research into this video and the history stuff has been really tough because I'm not an archaeologist and I don't know anybody who's an archaeologist. So I've had to rely on Google for a lot of this stuff. If I get anything wrong, please issue corrections in the comments down below, not just for me, but for other viewers watching as well. Oh, and there are a lot of names of people, locations and items that I'll be referring to in this video. And I guarantee I'll get some of them pronounced wrong. I'd like to apologize in advance for that. That having been said, let's go through the entire history of music. When was music invented? Is it even possible to answer that question? In all honesty, no. We don't even have an exact date for when humans started to speak, let alone sing. The best we can do is try to figure out the first kind of instrument humans might have played, and the answer to that would be percussion. How do we know that? Well, it doesn't take much to pick up two sticks and bang them together. If you want a more scientific approach, have a look at this. Percussion instruments made from mammoth bones have been discovered in present-day Belgium. Now, these instruments are thought to date from around 70,000 BC. Now, just for clarification, I'm not 100% sure that this photo is of the mammoth bone in question, but I do know that this is a photo of a bone instrument that would have been played by running a stick along either side from roughly the same time period. So we have percussion. The next logical step would be some form of wind instrument, like, say, flutes. It's not that much of a stretch to imagine someone finding a hollow bone or a horn of some kind and blowing into it and realizing, eh, that actually sounds pretty good. The earliest form of wind instrument ever discovered was the Paleolithic flute. This particular flute was an Aurignacian flute. It's thought to have been created between 35,000 and 43,000 years ago. The flutes were made of bone and ivory. The one in this picture was made of animal bone. Other flutes from this time period have been discovered to have been made from bird bones and mammoth tusks and were chosen for their hollowness once the marrow had been removed. Most modern day single reed instruments are descended from instruments collectively referred to as the Mehmet. The Mehmet originated in Egypt between 2778 and 2723 BC. They were frequently depicted on the reliefs of ancient Egyptian pyramids and tombs. Most mammoths, like the one you're looking at here, were double clarinets, where two reed tubes were tied or glued together to form one instrument. Now, this particular one was made in 1975 in Egypt, but it serves to give us a good idea of what they probably looked like thousands of years ago. The birth of the string instrument is only around 200 years after the reed instruments. It wouldn't be long before someone would discover that if you stretch a piece of animal gut, it makes a beautiful sound when you pluck it. This is not even animal gut, this is just a piece of string. You know what, you get my points. The Lyres of Ur were a group of four string instruments excavated at the Royal Cemetery of Ur in modern Iraq in 1922. They date back to between 2550 and 2450 BC. Now, strictly speaking, the Lyres of Ur were actually three lyres and one harp. The three lyres are called the Golden Lyre of Ur, or Bull's Lyre, the Queen's Lyre, and the Silver Lyre. The strings were made of cow or sheep gut. They are truly beautiful instruments. The lyre would eventually evolve into the modern guitar and the harp into the modern piano, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We don't even have a way to write music down yet. The earliest form of brass instrument is the trumpet, dating back to around 2000 BC. Bronze and silver trumpets have been found in Tutankhamun's grave in Egypt. The earliest form of musical notation can be found in a cuneiform tablet that was created at Nippur in Babylonia in present-day Iraq, believed to be from about 1400 BC. The exact notation system used on the tablet is controversial. The next step in the evolution of music is tuning. The first person to ever devise a musical tuning system was Pythagoras in around 500 BC. The Pythagorean tuning system uses intervals based on the ratio 3 to 2. 
Now this ratio, also known as a perfect fit, is chosen because it's easiest to tune by ear. As a side note, don't forget that the idea of waveforms and frequencies did not exist yet. The way that Pythagoras would have worked out his tuning system would have been by using something called a monochord, something like this. If we fret halfway, we get an octave. If we fret two-thirds of the way, we get a fifth. And if we fret three-quarters, we get a fourth. And so on and so forth. The point I'm trying to make is that rather than dealing with frequencies, Pythagoras used string lengths. Now, if you're a musician and you try this tuning system out, you'll find out pretty quickly why we stopped using it. Pythagoras was much more concerned with making the numbers look nice than with the actual sound of it. But don't worry, we still have two other systems to get through. Speaking of the Greeks, did you know that they invented the first keyboard instruments? In the 3rd century BC, the Greeks invented the first keyboard type instruments. It was a pipe organ of sorts. Wind supply was created by the weight of displaced water in an airtight container. A few centuries later, in the 2nd century AD, Claudius Ptolemy invents a new tuning system, just intonation. Now for those wondering about the difference between Pythagorean and just intonation, well, Pythagorean is calculated by stacking fifths. Every scale degree is calculated based off the previous fifth. So we calculate our octave, then we use our octave to calculate our fifth, then we use our fifth to calculate the next interval, and so on and so forth. Now with just intonation, we don't stack. Every interval is calculated from the fundamental or root note. Guido d'Arezzo was a Benedictine monk and music theorist born in Italy between 1990 and 1999. In the 11th century, he developed a notation system from the pneumatic practices that eventually evolved into the system we use today. In that same century, he invented solfege. Solfege is a tool for singers to easily communicate pitch using syllables to refer to the different notes at a given scale. It's a system we still use today. At this point in history, things start moving a little quicker. In 1150, we enter into our first classical music era, the medieval period. In 1397, Hermann Pohl invents the world's first harpsichord. Now, I couldn't find when the first clavichord was invented, but it does show up in the 14th century. For those wondering about the difference between a harpsichord and a clavichord, a harpsichord works by plucking strings, whereas a clavichord has metal blades that sort of graze the strings. Clavichords are not really meant for performances. They were mostly used as practice instruments, and they were very useful tools for composition. You know what else shows up in the 14th century? The first guitar-like instruments. The vejuela is a fretted, plucked Spanish string instrument shaped like a guitar, but tuned like a lute. Wait, does that mean the lute was the first guitar-like instrument? Look, the history of the guitar is complicated and debatable, so let's just move on. 1400 also marks the beginning of the second classical music era, the Renaissance period. 1550 is roughly when the first violin is invented, and in 1584 is when we have the invention of equal temperament tuning. That's the tuning system we use today. It was developed by Chu Tseyu, a Chinese Ming dynasty prince. Meanwhile, Simon Stevin, a Flemish mathematician, scientist and music theorist, developed the same system a year later. In 1600, we have the beginning of the third classical music era, the Baroque period. So we're talking about composers like Bach, Vivaldi, Handel, and Pachelbel. This is also when Claudio Monteverdi formally assigned specific instruments to perform his music, creating the first orchestra. Also around this time, Jean-Baptiste Lully becomes the first conductor to use a baton. That's not a particularly important scientific advancement, I just found it interesting. Finally, Bartolomeo Cristofori invents a keyboard instrument that uses hammers to strike strings instead of plucking them. He calls his invention the pianoforte. In modern parlance, we've dropped the second half of that word, so everyone calls it a piano. 1750 brings us the beginning of the fourth classical music era, the classical period. Famous composers from this period were Mozart, Beethoven, and Haydn. 1830 brings us the early Romantic period, so Chopin, Tchaikovsky, Liszt, Mendelssohn, and Sibelius. Yep, the Sibelius software was named after Finnish composer Jean Sibelius. You know, it's fascinating to me. Up to this point, we've invented almost every major instrument group, except for electronic instruments. That's still at least another hundred years away. We've figured out a notation system and multiple tuning systems. But you know what we haven't figured out yet? Concert pitch. Basically, we don't have an agreed standard for an initial pitch to tune to. 
Now, in 1834, the Stuttgart Conference of the Society of German Natural Scientists and Physicians would attempt to rectify that. They came up with A440, which just means that middle A, or A above middle C, should be tuned to 440 Hz. In 1859, the French government would disagree. They set their own standard to A435. Yet look, there's a whole history of conflict here involving orchestras and opera singers, and we really don't have time to talk about it in this video, but you really should Google it. It's fascinating stuff. In 1857, we have our first musical recording, and it's not Thomas Edison. He comes later. A French gentleman by the name of Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville invents the phonautograph. What you're about to hear is the oldest known intelligible recording of the human voice, presumably of Scott de Martinville himself singing All Claire de la Lune. Just, uh, you'll have to excuse the quality, this recording is 163 years old. <laughs> In 1860, we have the beginning of the late Romantic period. In 1877, we have the invention of the first microphone by Emil Berliner while he was working with Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison invents his phonograph in 1878. That's a whole 21 years after the phonautograph was invented. The phonograph was a precursor to the gramophone, which is a precursor to the record player. That same year, Edison also starts the very first record label, to the chagrin of every musical artist out there. In 1889, New York Phonograph Company has founded the very first recording studio. Now, a lot of people thought this was the end of the music industry. I mean, why go to a live performance when I can just listen to a recording? In 1910, the first headphones are invented by an American named Nathaniel Baldwin, known as a radio headset. He invents them because he can't hear his preacher during Sunday morning services. The first documented example of the electric PA system being used to amplify speech and music at a public event was on December 24, 1915 at San Francisco City Hall when Jensen and Pridham's Magnavox system was publicly demonstrated. In 1918, the Chicago-based Ludwig Drum Company debuts the Jazzerup, an all-in-one set with a single bass drum and pedal, a snare, two cymbals and a wood block. In 1920, we have the beginning of the seventh and final classical music era, the modern period. We're talking about composers like Philip Glass, George Gershwin, Igor Stravinsky, and film score composers like Hans Zimmer, John Williams, and Danny Elfman. Yeah, technically we're still in this era. In 1928, Fritz Flumer from Germany invents magnetic tape, giving us a slightly more convenient way to record music. That same year, Stromberg Voicenet launches the first guitar amplifier. In 1929, German physicist Walter Nurst invents the first electric piano. He calls it the Neo Bechstein Electric Grand Piano. The first electrically amplified string instrument to be marketed commercially was a cast aluminium lap steel guitar nicknamed the Frying Pan, designed in 1931 by George Beauchamp, the general manager of the National Stringed Instrument Corporation, with Paul Barth, who was the vice president. In 1939, the world finally agrees on an international pitch standard of A440. Wasn't that what the Germans thought of in the first place? We invented an electric guitar before we were able to agree on a pitch standard. Let that sink in for a minute. In 1946, a company known as Rowe Industries answers the prayers of guitarists everywhere and releases the very first commercially available guitar effects device, the Dearmond Tremolo Control. In 1948, thanks to CBS, we were introduced to the world's first LP vinyl record created by Peter Goldmark. The record had a capacity of around 21 minutes per side and was 12 inches wide, playing at a speed of 33 and a third revs per minute. In September of that same year, the first 12 inch LP was released. It was a performance of Mendelssohn's Concerto in E minor by Nathan Milstein on the violin with the New York Philharmonic conducted by Bruno Walter. In 1953, the first practical wireless microphone for performers was invented. The Shure Vagabond 88 was powered by two hearing aid batteries and could transmit within a performance circle of approximately 700 square feet. In 
In 1955, we see the introduction of the first electronic sound synthesizer, a huge instrument developed by American acoustical engineers Harry Olson and Herbert Ballar at the Radio Corporation of America Laboratories at Princeton, New Jersey. ILIAC Suite is the first example of computer-aided composition. It ran on ILIAC 1 programs by Lejaren Hiller and Leonard Isaacson in 1957. This is essentially a precursor to Muse School. In 1963, Lou Ottens and his team at the Dutch company Philips released the first cassette tape. Music lovers everywhere celebrate. We can finally make our own mixtapes. A lot of people thought this was the end of the music industry. I mean, why buy an album when I can just record a mixtape off the radio? In 1963, 13-year-old Stephen Ambrose develops the first in-ear monitors by inserting tiny speakers into a clay mold that he adapted from swimming earplug designs. Of course, IEMs would only really become popular in the 90s. In 1977, Dr. Thomas G. Stockham develops the first DAW, bringing together a mini-computer, disk drive, video display, and software. In 1982, the first commercial compact disc is produced. It's a 1979 recording of Chopin waltzes performed by Claudia Orao. In 1987, a postgraduate student at the University of Erlangen in southern Germany by the name of Karl Heinz Brandenburg develops the MP3 format. He uses Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega for testing purposes, making it the very first song to ever be compressed into an MP3. 1993, the first free high-fidelity online music archive of downloadable songs is created. It's called the Internet Underground Music Archive, created by Rob Lord, Jeff Patterson, and John Luini from the University of California, Santa Cruz. All right, it had to happen eventually. The first pirated song was Until It Sleeps by Metallica off their album Load, released in 1996. The first portable MP3 device was not the iPod. It was actually the MP Man F10 player, launched in 1997 by Seihan Information Systems, a South Korean company. It was first released in South Korea in 1998 and later licensed for North American distribution to Iger Labs, which rebranded them as the Iger Man F10 and F20. On the 1st of June 1999, Sean Fanning and Sean Parker create Napster. Now I could take a left turn here and go off on a major tangent about the Napster story, but honestly, it really deserves a video of its own. In fact, do a search on YouTube right now and you'll find dozens of videos on the subject. On the 9th of January 2001, iTunes is launched. And on October 23rd of the same year, Steve Jobs introduces the iPod to the world. It could fit a thousand songs and it had a 10 hour battery. Now, I just want to remind you, this was not the first portable MP3 player. The MP Man had been released in South Korea and America three years earlier. On the 23rd of April, 2006, Daniel Ek and Martin Lorenzen of Stockholm, Sweden, create Spotify. It's now 2023, and there are at least 38 different music streaming services. Anyone can record a song in their own home and upload it to one of these services for the world to hear. To any musicians watching this, my brothers and sisters, it's been a long road spanning around 72,000 years. We started by hitting a large bone with a stick and progressed through over 60 empires, including the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the British Empire, all to today. We invented over 1,500 different musical instruments and over 1,300 different genres. Throughout history, Thousands of people have contributed their skills and knowledge to develop the instruments we play today. Thousands of scientists and mathematicians have helped to create the musical language we use to understand and express the songs we create. Thousands of inventors and engineers have contributed to the technology that we use to perform, record and store the music that we create. We've arrived at a point in time where a laptop and a MIDI controller gives me access to any instrument or sound that I could possibly think of. We, the human race, have composed hundreds of millions of songs. And I'd like to raise a glass to every person who ever contributed to this magnificent story. To music theorists like Pythagoras, Ptolemy, D'Arezzo and Chi Tsayu. To all of the great composers like Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Tchaikovsky, John Williams, Hans Zimmer, John Cage, the list goes on. To the inventors, Herman Pohl, Christofori, Scott de Martinville, Nathaniel Baldwin, George Beauchamp. And finally, to all musicians past, present and still to come. Whether you're a touring musician or a bedroom musician, whether you've released dozens of albums or there happens to be a home video somewhere of you singing Happy Birthday, 
whether you've performed in front of tens of thousands of people or serenaded someone you love, you are a part of this story. And on behalf of humanity, I thank you.